Well, hello again, everybody. Thanks for downloading the Comics Are Great podcast, uh, recorded live from the Ann Arbor District Library, broadcasted live on Ustream. Uh, you can get to that by going to Comics Are Great. Dot TV, and it's recorded every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we have got a couple guests here, a couple of remote Skype guests today uh, to talk a lot about a lot of really cool stuff. But before we go into that, I just wanted to explain, well, I'll just go ahead and introduce them first, and then we can explain why we're doing this out of a library, because I did not take the time last episode to uh, properly ex ex express my gratitude to the Ann Arbor District Library for making this show possible and the people involved. So uh, to my left... Uh, virtually speaking, is Mr. Rob Stenzinger of ArtGeekZoo.com. Hey, everyone. Rob, you, you will no doubt remember from some past uh, other podcasts that I've done called uh, Art and Story uh, at, art, at ArtAndStoryPodcast.com. Uh, and Rob also does a podcast called the uh, Polytechnicast. Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's an art journal podcast um, centered around the things I make um, around my webcomic, uh, Art Geek Zoo. That's right, artgeekzoo.com. We're going to yeah. talk about that more in a second. Uh, to my right, virtually speaking, we have uh, somebody I'm very excited to talk to for the first time, Mr. Tom Hart of tomhart.net, well known for his work on a comic called Hutch Owen. Hi. How are you? Good. Hey, hey uh, Tom, actually, we have a friend in common. Uh, I don't know if you, well, I don't know if you mentioned me, but uh, you work with uh, Stephanie Mannheim of stephaniemannheim.com, an Ann Arbor <laughs> expat. I, I do. I didn't, um, I didn't know you knew her, although I was going to mention it since she's in Ann Arbor as well. She's terrific. She's my, my go-to intern. <laughs> she helps me all the time, and she's full of so much energy that I can basically just say, Stephanie, what do you think about this? Can you, we, can you do this? And, she'll, and then just leave her alone, and she'll do it. And As long as I feed her enough coffee and some Indian <laughs> now and then, she's okay. <laughs> she, she is, she's a dynamo, uh, yeah. for sure. I, I taught a class uh, uh, through the Community Resource uh, Project here in Ann Arbor where I was teaching Stephanie a cartooning course for a year, and she was visiting my, my studio to do that. And uh, she would come in, and she'd spin around, and there would be ink and paper all over my house. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it would always be a 20-minute cool-down process of trying to figure out where all of her pens and paper went before she packed up to go back home. But yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. It's great. She is an exceedingly talented kid, isn't she? I mean, she you you could just looking at the work she's doing now, you know she's going to be a huge star in a couple of oh, years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, completely. And she's and she's full of energy. She's the one um spearheading a bunch of publishing projects here with a with a bunch of other cartoonists. She's the one going to the, like the impossible to deal with Ivy League school and still doing all these publishing projects in the meantime and and being the editor and publisher and all the all the uh all the kids going to art school are complaining they don't have enough time for their art for the publishing projects, and she's like, "I'm in art, or uh, I'm in Columbia. Like, I shouldn't have time for this, but I do. So get with it." And she just whips them into shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she makes the time. There's no question. Yeah, she must run out about two hours of sleep a night. But anyway, it's Stephanie, yeah. StephanieManheim.com. Uh, she's uh, she's she's a terrific person to watch. Uh, just for her, she's also on Tumblr and on Twitter. Uh, Steph the artist, I think, on Tumblr. Uh, but uh, she's going places. She's a very talented and very dedicated human being. So, uh, yep. yeah, just wanted to make a mention that she talked about you all the time. So oh. uh, <laughs> That's really nice. I um, Yeah, she, I mean, she's so good. I've, I've brought her into some of the, the things I host in, in New York City. Like I host a, reading, a live reading twice a year where I get some of my favorite cartoonists and, um, and we read in this, this bar. Um, and she was, she's the youngest person I ever brought in. I, I just realized her work was good enough, and she was funny enough, and she would bring great energy to the stage. So I had her, I had her at the most recent one on Easter Sunday. She was great. Oh, that's right. That was that was for the fundraiser for that we're going to talk it about. Was. Yeah, in a little yeah. bit. Um, but before we go any further, I just wanted to say a few words about the Ann Arbor District Library and why we're doing this show here. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to take uh, time to say on the record, uh, thank you to Matt Dubay of the uh, CR department at the Ann Arbor District Library for all the hard work he put into making this show happen. Uh, it's no easy task setting up audio equipment and streaming equipment and computer equipment to make sure that we can both record a podcast, a video podcast, and stream it live over the internet. Uh, it's trickier than it sounds. Uh, also, Tom Smith, who has been doing a lot of the video editing on this show, and Eli Nyberger, who greenlit this show to be produced by the Ann Arbor District Library. And what I hope to do through this 
is create something that is a bit of a weekly event at the Ann Arbor Library uh, to bring cartoonists together to uh, both local and global to uh, uh, spotlight how interesting and awesome these people are and how their work, many of their works are available in the Ann Arbor District Library's collection. So introducing you guys to Ann Arbor proper uh, and then hopefully uh, introduce you guys to the Ann Arbor District Library so maybe we can get Tom Hart or Rob Stenzinger to come out to do an event for us sometime, like a, like a talk or a panel or even a workshop. That would be incredible. Uh, so anyway, uh, I do think that ADL.org does deserve a round of applause from the audience in the chat uh, for making this show possible. Uh, well, thank you, Rob. <laughs> and Tom. So, okay, so now let's get through introductions, introducing you guys to the general public, uh, because there are general public watching, uh, librarians and uh, just uh, fans of comics. I want to talk about a little bit, I want to talk about Hutch Owen uh, by... Tom Hart, I was just rereading Unmarketable uh, the other night. Let's see if I can get it on camera here. Yeah, there we go. And it's in the, in the Ann Arbor District Library collection, as a matter of fact. Uh, Tom, when I was reading this uh, last night, or the night before, yeah. I was roaring with laughter. It is so <coughs> intensely funny. And I'm wondering if you can introduce us to what Hutch Owen is about. Why, why should people read this book? Well, Hutch, Hutch is the... the kind of guy who wants to not give in to all the advertising. He wants to not give in to all the sort of corporatization of everything around him. He wants to sort of live his own life, um, do, what he, do what he loves, do what he wants to do, and just not be affected by all that stuff, not be told to buy anything, not be forced to buy anything, or, or at least persuaded heavily. Um, he wants to find a good job that's going to affect people in a, in a, in a decent way and, not, and is not going to seem pointless. And um, because he wants those things, he uh, he really has no life to speak of. He lives he's homeless. He lives in an alleyway or wherever he can find on the outskirts of town. And um, but that doesn't keep him from sort of ranting, trying to tell people that they should live their own life under you know under with his morals. Um, so that's that character in a nutshell. And I've done I've done stories with him for about twenty well about eighteen years or something like that. Um, Hitting him up against a, a lot of times a sort of uh, a corporate, a sort of corporate villain named Dennis Warner, but um, but Dennis has some really good qualities, just as Hutch has some bad qualities. Yeah, in in the uh, middle story in Unmarketable, there's this great oh, it's it's all about um, post 9/11, and it's this this very sinister uh, marketing expert who's trying yeah, yeah. to. Uh, help Warner with his business by uh, tying in his tying in the, 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 some kind of new building on the site uh, where the, the, the twin towers stood, and uh, I gotta find this line because it was just brilliant. Where we dis discover that she is the most evil person in the story, and we thought he was the most evil because it right, starts right, right. it starts out with him knocking golf golf balls off of skyscrapers trying to hit bumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, or just I, or hitting him into the rubble of the uh, of the towers, which sounds heartless but he's kind of heartless but he's also so um, I think simple-minded and devoted to pleasure that he just doesn't see it as heartless it just seems like a cool thing to do right right and, and so she is she the the marketing expert goes through this this just despicable Ellsworth Tui level speech about well, how she's going to spin uh, his business into the the Twin Tower site and then there's the the great uh, Tom Hart ellipsis for several word balloons, and finally, uh, Warner says, "What the hell are you talking about?" And then the crony says, "Mr. Warner just wants his golf balls back." And he says, "Yeah, I was just chipping them into the wreckage, and they kept hitting all those bubs." And he's smiling gleefully as he points out the window. So we discover he's a bad man, but he's not truly sinister like this marketing woman. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, there's a lot. There's a lot of that, and a lot of times in the in the marketing world, you sort of have to match what you believe your client's energy is and what you believe your client's desires are. And so I think that's what's happening with that woman is, yeah, she's sinister, but she thinks Dennis is sinister than he, more sinister than he is. And so she tries to match him evil for evil, and, and there's just this disconnect there. Yeah, yeah. And you, you want to, I mean, I hope, I, I hope you like The Simpsons, or at least won't take offense to this, because uh, it's meant in a, in a kind spirit, is that I, I think of this as being humor on the order of The Simpsons, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. It continues to delight me, because 
it makes fun of the world, but with the arrows of perfect love. It's it's saying that everybody in their own way is in some way lovable. Even somebody is is, is revolting as uh, Mo Sislak is, is uh, lovable in his way, right? Uh, and, and that's the fa- feeling I got from Hutch Owen. Oh, that's nice. I mean, I've always, I've really always tried to make the characters complex enough so that they actually have some humanity, especially Dennis, because frankly, he's fun to write. He's, he, there's got to be some, it's, he's fun, he must be fun to be. Um, as, as bad as he is, it's, I've never been able to make the Hutch Owen and the Dennis dynamic a simple black and white one. I realize that they're maybe even coming from the same place, which is just a love, a, a sort of lust for life, but Hutch doesn't have any resources to access it, and Dennis has way too many, so he can pleasure himself in any way possible, and Hutch <laughs> is just trying to beg at the, at the extremes for dregs. And I should also say that that your art style is also uh, a lot of fun to look at because it's just so energetic. And I also want to I want to uh, pat you on the back for um, the segment in at least in this book. And I know this is an older book. This is what, what from two thousand four or so. Um, yeah, and that was yeah, two or three something. But uh, there's a segment in the middle uh, called The Future where you did sort of a, a pencil version of the story. And it's very, it's very rough in places. And I, I just loved it. It was like looking at thumbnails. But it was like a finished story. Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. I really wrestled with how, whether or not that was the way to pr- present that. Um, I should add that my, unlike a lot of uh, natural-born, talented cartoonists, my first drafts are hideously ugly. <laughs> Second drafts are slightly less hideously ugly, but still hideously ugly. Even my third and fourth, and by the fourth I'm usually in inks, even those up till about 2004 or so were hideously ugly. Um, but I, I, it was a story that came out very, very quickly, and I wanted it to feel like it was just a sort of uh, um, missive from the future that was just, uh, it, it kind of didn't all come into focus. You know, it was like if you were... Uh, to use Star Trek terminology, viewing it through some sort of wormhole or something, and uh. so I didn't mind the sloppiness, and I didn't mind the, um, I didn't mind how rough it was. It seemed like the right way to do that. Well, it, it read great, and uh, hey. so I, I want to recommend to anybody in the Ann Arbor area. I'm going to return this book into the collection today, <laughs> so you can get your hands on it and read it for yourselves. Um, I like that story, but you know I haven't read it in so long, and, and technology happens so fast. Can you remind me? Did we? Uh, did any of these things come true yet? <laughs> oh, the, the the people being chipped in the head, where they can be constantly yeah, they notified. Yeah, chips in their head, and well, the the location based advertising, I think, is coming to to pass. I mean, there's a scene where Hutch is just trying to drink a darn cup of coffee, and he keeps talking to him. And uh, it, it, there's like a, some kind of a chip or a screen on it that is uh, just saying, uh, in between sips, ask me about your favorite celebrities. <laughs> and then Hutch says, uh, what, what about if I just want a cup of coffee? Uh, Judge Judy's favorite is rum and Maxwell House, you know. So, um, but then when he crushes it, oh, we lost Tom for a second there. Let's see if I can get him back. What a bum out. Because there he was talking about his work. But anyway... Uh, let me hang up on Tom and get him back. So, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> so, we can turn to you, and uh, it is not my intention to use you to, to vamp while we uh, deal with technical issues, but because I did intend, I had every intention of talking about Art Geek Zoo, the book that you do, which is available through artgeekzoo.com. This is, is this on Kablam? Is this on Indie Planet? Uh, it is on Kablam and Indie Planet as well. Um, yeah, that's essentially the store on Art Geek Zoo just will send you there. Um, and the digital version is in the uh, illustrated section as well. Oh, uh, oh, the illustrated section.com. Cool. Yeah. So, hey, we got a, we got a second shot. Let me see if I can get this uh, better picture of uh, Art Geek Zoo for people to see. And lower it. And this is great audio, but hey. This is for the video folks, Art Geek Zoo, Volume 1, uh, Hidden Talent. What's Art Geek Zoo about while I call Tom back? Well, <clears throat> Art... Whoa, now I just... Sorry. Threw oh, hey, Tom. Uh, I got to get, Rob- I gotta get conference you back into the call with Rob. Oh, no. Do you have something to talk about if that happens again? <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There we go. We're back. Okay. Hey, t- hey Rob. Yeah, we're good. All right, so let me uh, 
add Tom Hart to this while you talk. I'm sorry, Tom. I didn't mean to put you on, or Rob, I didn't mean to put you on hold while I was doing this. So No problem. So I'll uh, go ahead and say what you're saying. Oh, well, um, Art Geek Zoo is, is a, um, it's a, it's an adventure story with um, uh, a penguin who is a talented guitarist and his uh, mystical guitar friend. Um, essentially, they form a band and they work through their creative issues and challenges and um, eventually um, go off on adventures with their band to um, fight the challenging things going on in that world, um, both externally and internally. Oh. And there we go. Back again. Yeah, you're back again. Sorry about that. The new Skype is uh, pretty tr pretty difficult to get uh, multi-users uh, uh, conferenced in. Sorry, Rob. I'm I'm ruining your your uh, your elevator pitch for your book. Finish your finish yeah. finish your pitch, and let's talk. We'll talk about it as soon as I get Tom back in. But anyway, so it's about it's about a uh, uh, a guitarist who has massive stage fright, right? Yeah, so the, the main character, um, the odd thing is, I mean, he thinks he wants to, you know, go to a school and become a very skilled uh, and accomplished guitarist, but, I mean, the huge thing in his way is uh, his horrible stage fright. Um, and uh, he starts to get some friends, and they, they start working through uh, a way that he can deal with that. Essentially, he dresses up like a big ninja star. <laughs> and uh, in that disguise, he starts to feel free enough to perform, and he gets connected with his abilities, and... There's kind of this whole uh, uh, idea that music is magic in the in the world, and um, and it represents what uh, uh, you know what we can do and what we can create, but also mixed in with the ideas and any kind of story like you come across uh, high magic, you can do cool stuff with it, uh, and uh, yeah. And it, it it is a magical world because you can have talking guitars, grumpy talking guitars. And uh, and catmen teachers and uh, yeah. and the other neat thing that I wanted to point out is that it starts out with um, you started in a different format when you began. And you started oh. in a vertical format and then you switched to a horizontal format later on. But you included all that in the book, which I thought was pretty cool to watch that process unfold rather than going back and revisiting pages over and over and over again, right? Uh, yeah. Um, well, thanks. I, I mean, certainly this version of the story, um, I, I it. It, it plays out as it did because um, I wanted to share the story, but at the same time, grow as an artist. Um, and I really didn't have a lot of things premeditated. So what you get to see is both the, uh, the narrative play out and see me grow and change quite a bit as an artist. And uh, I, in the end, I decided I'm okay with it, and I published it as is. Yeah, and, I th and I think that's pretty awesome. I think that that... that not being too perfectionist about that and actually sharing that sort of process and growth is very interesting to both, you know, uh, casual readers and practitioners, right? So, at least to me. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to try getting Tom Hart in here one more time and see what, see what kind of calamity I cause. <laughs> All right. You there, Rob? I'm Hi, still here. Tom. Hey, cool. Tom. Okay. It worked that time. I got everybody conferenced all back together. Sorry about that. that if my wireless just uh, spotted out. I didn't realize I was affecting the entire show. But if that happens again, I'll move to my land um, line computer. No big deal. No big deal. It's just that I was running into Skype issues because the new Skype has um, very, how shall I say, interesting new uh, us usability features that make it uh, uh, very tricky to use sometimes. So it wasn't you as much as it was me wrestling and uh, monkeying with Skype. So. Um, Okay, we got through our introductions. People, so Art Geek Zoo is available at artgeekzoo.com, and uh, you should get it, it, librarians, you should get a copy, you know, put it into your collection. And then uh, Hutch Owen is in the Ann Arbor District Library's collection. If, it's, if any other libraries, librarians listening, if you don't have it in your collection, what's wrong with you? So there's another aspect to what we all do that I think is interesting to talk about today, and that is that we all teach. We are all teaching artists as well as cartoonists, and uh, Tom is starting up the Sequential Artist Workshop in Gainesville, Florida, and uh, you've got a fundraiser going on that we'll talk about in a second. But if you guys don't mind, I would like to start the discussion off by saying, first, of course, as a, as a, as a teacher and comics advocate, I am all for what you guys do. Uh, but in order to facilitate the discussion, I thought I'd play devil's advocate and throw a few devil's advocate questions at you guys and see if we can kind of make a case for why teaching comics is important. Because 
going from the devil's advocate standpoint, uh, I could see somebody saying, well, gee, you got art school. You learn figure drawing. You learn creative, creative writing. What more do you need? Why, why go and create a comics program? Why, what, what are you trying to do? What, what kind of opportunistic stuff is this that you're trying to prey on the popularity of this silly medium to get kids to give you money so that you can uh, continue to have uh, a living uh, aside from making comics? Um, who wants to start? I can start. Go for it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's no cough button on this. Um, well, the obvious <laughs> answer is that the the language of comics really is different, and you, you really can get there through drawing and um, and writing. You know, different types of writing, different types of drawing, not just figure drawing. You're gonna have to study graphic design. You're gonna have to study composition. You're gonna have to study um, classic paintings, things like that. And when it comes to writing, it, yeah, creative writing and poetry and decent having a good decent essay voice. Um, all of that will help, and all of that can get you to to a place where you can make some pretty great comics, but there's still a history and some tradition and some ways to use the language that um, that don't come instantly. And those are worth researching and those are worth studying and keeping with. And frankly, sometimes people just want to study that art form. A lot of people really love that art form. And I mean, and I mean students when I say a lot of people. A lot of students um, maybe want to start with using it. They don't really want to go at it through a couple different separate routes and they want to just learn the art form as it exists currently, which is a mixture of words and pictures and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and just intensive, intensely sort of put themselves in the middle of that art form, creating them, studying them, etc. You know, so like any art form, I think it's, it's fine. I, I imagine you could have made the same argument back in the early days of cinema and say, well, you got, you know, photography and you got playwriting, so what else do you need? But there's a different language there. Oh, oh. Uh, can you point to one thing? Uh, like, okay, here I am being the skeptic, crossing my arms, like, oh, well, what's one thing that's different between comics and drawing and writing, and why is that worth teaching? <laughs> <laughs> one thing. <laughs> I know there's a million, right? But I'm just asking you to pick one to try to sell this, yeah, this dad who wants, who's, who's uh, concerned about sending his daughter off to comic school. The... You know, I'll 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 take the, I'll take the McLeod bow out on here and say, and use his um his sort of metaphor of of when you approach it just from writing or just from drawing, and then try to merge the two once you get good at the other one. You you there's this there can be this divide that you really don't um, that's hard to bridge. Um, studying how those two integrate is a is a different thing. It really it really is different. Um, I'm answering the first question. What, was the second question just a grouchier version of the first? <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of. It was sort of yes. It was. It was kind of like uh, I was asking for like one example to back up oh, what you yeah. said. Oh gosh! Can I, I mean, take a swing? You yep. never open up um, anything that like came out of Fort Thunder and um, find. It's going to be very difficult to find. Um, historical examples in, in either writing or visual arts. I mean, things like that are naturally comics. They're very bizarre. Fort Thunder was this um, uh, group of cartoonists in Rhode Island in the mostly the two thousand early two thousands and late nineties a little bit. And and um, you know they really opened up cartooning in a lot of ways and it, and let a lot of fine art sensibilities come in. But it was fine art sensibilities that wasn't even expressing itself in galleries. Um, but that stuff, when you look at it now, is, is very uniquely comics. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, then, and they're also very popular, and those guys are in the Whitney Museum sometimes now. So for the grouchy dad who says, I'm not going to send my kid or whatever, I'll say, well, Fort Thunder made it into the Whitney Museum, and they sell out shows and all sorts of stuff. Um, but there are lots more examples. Well, Rob, Rob mentioned that he might have something to throw in on this. Go, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, it's... Um I don't know how, how widely applicable this is, but it, uh, I mean, for me, uh, uh, Tom, you mentioned the, the Scott McCloud book. Was that, it, was it probably um, Understanding Comics? Sure, yeah. And uh, I know when I read that, um, I really wasn't making comics yet. And to me, it was like I just found this magic tome of, of, uh, of an incredibly powerful form of communication. And uh, I mean, I drank that Kool-Aid. And then it took me quite a while to start figuring out how to how to deal with it. But then in the practice of dealing with it, I can I think what I could do to say why you'd want to teach and learn it is that uh, you um, to to be able when you can 
make comics well, you can do some incredibly uh, compressed, powerful communication that just sort of reaches through um, more than just one image or just uh, uh, prose could do. It's it's this powerful combined thing that they that uh, represents something, a third thing that's not prose and it's not the visual communication. It's both. Um, so it's to get that communicating capability, but also the practice of integrating them. It's super applicable in no matter in a lot of jobs, right? So you have a desk job and you want to make a good presentation. If you're if you practice making comics, chances are you're going to make a way more interesting presentation. That was where I wanted to go next. Thank you for anticipating my question, Rob. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so often we think alike on these things. Is that I was going to ask? Here's here's the other grumpy dad question. Is that, well, gee, you know. Uh, comics, there's not a lot of money in that business. You have, there's a small percentage of people who make pretty good livings, and there's a whole bunch of hopefuls who don't make their entire living off of comics. Uh, what good is it then? What good is it to teach these skills to my kid? You're, you're just, you're just uh, uh, filling them full of uh, silly hopes and dreams that are never going to come true. What, what good does, does learning um, how to make comics do for you in the real world, right? Well, it's true. I mean, the, these skills are, are maybe more applicable now than, than they ever have been to the real world. Um, let me step back and just say that you train somebody in any art form, and there's not, e- there's not even a hope of a guarantee of some sort of living out of that. What you want to do is get, you want to um, enrich their lives, make them critical thinkers, make them creative thinkers, and let them, um, with some guidance if they need it, let them find a path through the quote real world after that. Um, I think that's true of any art form. I don't think there's a single art form except maybe, uh, you know, union jobs in the, in, the, in the cinema or something where you know you'll get a, you know, a track, union track job laying down um, tracks for, uh, you know, grip tracks and stuff like that. But anyway, um, the, the way comics are applicable now is, is, is more than ever. We're, we're, in a, we're in a narrative soaked environment. We're in an image soaked environment. And, and learning how to tell stories, learning how to tell stories visually will prepare you for any, um, a lot of different jobs and a lot of different, and a lot of different um, objectives in this in this world. Sadly, most of them are in advertising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but that maybe that's not entirely true. I'll let Rob take it a little. Yeah, I want I want to hear from Rob on this because this is a great precursor to something that Rob's going to present at the Kids Read Comics event this June. Uh, gosh, in like a week or so, right? Uh, oh my God, it's really a week. Yeah, away. it's coming up quick. Uh, uh, but but you're going to be doing a, a workshop. Tell us about the workshop and and how that addresses what we were just talking about. Uh, the workshop is called Storytelling to Make uh, Your Comics UI Awesome. Um, so it's kind of this, this uh, you know, maybe at first gl- glance, kind of an odd mix of, of um, some disparate elements, right? Because you have comics, you have some digital art, and the ability to ra- interact with it um, all working together than like storytelling, right? Um, and I mean, the course thesis is that um, by practicing storytelling, you're well set up to do some user-centric design. And there are many disciplines, uh, many jobs where we're user-centric design practices are very handy. Um, I would say, yeah, probably some marketing-related ones uh, for sure, especially interactive marketing. Um, Definitely a a good place to, you know, build up some experience and a resume, Um, good place to to get some work Uh, in the real world. Um, And let's see. And then, of course, then there's many other related disciplines, uh, user interface design, um, content strategy, Stuff that that uh, you know pertaining to um, or maybe even it's getting a little more removed, but stuff like information architecture and whatnot, and all those concerns uh, you have in those specific disciplines, they map back to being a storyteller, uh, where you're able to uh, get some point across over the sharing of these ideas over time in. Um, you know whether it's prose or visual form, and I, in the presentation, I sort of give a little bit more of a an emphasis on the comic storytelling because once you have that, then you have sort of visual prioritization that you're practiced in, and that you can uh, uh, tap into in mm-hmm. your in your day job. So that'll be something to check out on what is it Sunday, June nineteenth, twenty eleven. You're going to be in Chelsea doing that workshop, right? 
Yeah, that's right. So, um, okay, well, you guys made cases. I think you made very compelling cases why it's important. Uh, you convinced the, the, the pretend grumpy old dad that I've been being right now. Uh, so I want to I want to take this opportunity to swing into talking about the sequential artist workshop, which is a school that uh, Tom Hart is starting up. And uh, man, you were teaching at SVA. What do you need to start another school for? Oh, well, you know, I'll be honest, and I'll actually sort of fold it into a little bit of the previous question. The previous question, or at least some of the things we were hitting, some of the topics we were hitting, were very career focused and very. Um, how, what jobs, what digital media, what you know, user interface and stuff like that can I, can I take my cartooning into? And um, I've been in New York City for 10 years and I did, a lot of, uh, I did a lot of public relations and marketing and stuff as I was doing my cartooning and I sort of shifted into teaching and cartooning full time during this whole time. And I've increasingly gotten tired of the commercial aspect of trying to be a cartoonist and being a cartoonist and I realize I I absolutely adore teaching it is one of is the most it's one of the best things um, in my life right now I, I just adore it and um, and so what I wanted to do was step out of New York City step out of the commercial environment step out of that race for um, for the, the career and the big goals and stuff and just find a place where I could in a low-key way, well, in a low-key environment, but a sort of intensive way, teach people how to be good storytellers, and more importantly, enrich their lives by teaching them how to tell their stories. That's what I wanted to do. I, it, it, I'm, I could easily have taught at SVA for another 20 or 30 years, and a lot of people are doing that. A lot of my peers will, will continue to do that, and, and hopefully we'll trade students, and I'll send them back and forth, and they'll send them down there or whatever. <laughs> but I, I honestly felt like the aggressive commercial environment was becoming too much for for me and I I wanted to get back to the art form and I wanted to teach getting back to the art form and so um and uh it's no coincidence that that Gainesville is where I decided to set settle because that's where I lived about 15 years ago and I I was uh living there when I met my wife and it's a great town and it's full of comics connections and it's full of their literary people and it's and it's just a great great place and I think it's a good place if you're, especially if you're a young person or maybe new to comics, I think it's a great place to um, settle into for a little while, devote yourself to the art form without, without freaking out too much about um, money and job and career and things like that. Um, that's the, the short answer. <laughs> so what, what kind of things, what kind of classes can you expect to take at the Sequential Artist Workshop? Could you just give us like a teaser for that? Yeah, well, still working it out. Um, well, I mean, I would imagine it'd be close to things that you taught at SVA, right? Sure, sure, and and things that um, things that I personally am not teaching at SVA, but are are being offered in our second year classes or something like that. So we'll have a we'll definitely have a comics. I see it as two comics classes: one that's exercise driven and um, full of formal games and full of sort of experiments to get students thinking in new ways. And then probably a project-oriented class where they can um, focus on something lo longer and fold in some of those exercises and, and, and other things that they're learning in the other classes. The project-driven class will be um, largely working on, the pro on their, their semester-long projects and workshopped inside the class and things like that. So and there's... We need, we need figure drawing and we need... Um, uh, well, let's just say figure drawing for now, um, and then I think we need you know we need some tool techniques, and it's going to start with pen and ink and a little bit of watercolor. But the truth is, is that we have to acknowledge that there are a lot of ways to make marks on the screen or on paper that are readable and and look good for comics. And so I want to also acknowledge those. I want to um, find ways to say sad as as much as I love pen and ink, I think it's possibly a bit cruel to inflict it on everybody as the only option. So I want to say like if you want to, so I want to give a broad range of media techniques and that's the third thing. It has to be a history class because there's such a huge history of comics in many different cultures and um, I see a lot of students come in with a very very sporadic understanding yeah. of that. It's, it's tough. 
I've, and, I've, I've, been, but, I've been given a uh, lesson plan that you, or that you developed, or rather a syllabus that you developed uh, by way of Stephanie. I hope I'm not getting her in trouble here. But uh, I remember looking it over and, and being really impressed that you had a big section on just studying Dennis the Menace in your class. Oh, I wonder when Stephanie, I don't know. Uh, well, it's true. I mean, there's a lot to learn from him. He's a great designer from Hank Ketchum. Yeah. Um, and we look at him for designing in black and white. Um, using those, using basically those two values to make really striking compositions. He's also great for, um, well, just simple picture plane compositions, but also for um, deep space, background, foreground, middle ground. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't spend too long on something like that, but I will bring him up as an as somebody who's worth looking at as a model for for some very excellent graphic design and composition. Sure. So yeah, so like studying studying our history is actually pretty important. The history of our of our craft and our people and whatnot. I mean, it, there's a, it's going to be a great tool for discovery, if nothing else, of uh, possibly influences and new ways of looking at our craft rather than coming at it from, oh, I read a couple issues of a DC comic series and I want to be a right. comics artist now. Which is there's nothing wrong with that as an entry right. point, right? But uh, then the next step is to dig a little bit deeper, right? Yeah, uh, that's that's absolutely true. And and uh, I've I've had enough students come back and thank me. For, you know, a lot of them will have to say very vague things like, you know, you were a great teacher, thank you so much. And a lot of them say specific things like, um, you showed me that one comic and that helped me understand what I wanted to do so, you know, so well. In fact, there's a, um, Jess, Jessica Fink is a um, graduate of mine who's um, becoming more and more popular. She just put out a book from, uh, from Top Shelf a couple weeks ago. And, and I, I noticed in an interview, she, she credited me with showing her Tijuana Bibles, which are... <laughs> And she was very grateful for that, but I, uh, it doesn't always happen like that. That's awesome. So I okay. explain that if you have to. Oh, a Tijuana Bible? Uh, pe people can look it up if they're not familiar with what those are. But yes, it is, it is a comic, and it's a bit of a subversive comic, but uh, a type of but comic. It, it, changed, it changed the trajectory of her career. She was very happy for it, and she wound up doing similar similar work for a very long time and very successfully. That's awesome. Yeah, and I saw the same development with Stephanie. When I first started teaching her, she was, I think, 13 years old, and she was really into manga and Rumiko Takahashi. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, she discovered Peter Bagg and Robert Crumb, and you, you're, you're familiar with her work, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's all of that kind of uh, in the underground kind of uh, angst-ridden stuff, and it's really just... It, it, incredibly funny like I, I told her I credited her with uh, drawing the most disgusting kissing scene I've ever seen in a comic in my entire life she keeps doing those disgusting kissing scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's it's brilliantly funny but um but when I met her when she was 13 I I would never have expected that so being introduced to this different stuff uh, can have a profound effect on an artist's career and on their outlook on their work right uh, but I do want to I want to take a minute to talk about uh, the fundraiser for the uh, the sequential artist workshop Sure. You're trying to you're trying to raise money to make the, this thing happen, and uh, that's at indiegogo.com slash creating the sequential artist workshop with dashes between all those words, and I'll link to it in the show notes, everybody. Um, but you can also get to it from um, the uh, sequential artist workshop website, right? Yeah, sequentialartistsworkshop.org. Should note that artists is plural. Sequential artists workshop. Artists, yeah. Yeah. And um, at the time of this recording, you are uh, not quite to halfway to your goal. Right. So, and there's 41 days left in the in the fundraiser. So I, I want to ask everybody who who thinks that this is important to uh, to pledge. And there's different prizes or uh, thank you gifts for everybody who pledges. Right. That's right. Um, we've got a lot of posters and um, some original art. Some really great original art. Some really great posters. Uh, we've got John Porcelino sort of working quietly in in the Midwest somewhere in L Illinois, working on a uh, wildlife of Florida poster, which, um, which we're going to make a limited print run of. Um, we've got some original drawings, all sorts of things. And we've actually got a few that we're going to be posting in a day or two that are brand new, um, that have come our way from artists offering to help by donating some artwork. So in a, in a day or two, we'll be sending out another email um, with some new artwork and some new thank you gifts. We're looking to raise about $7,000, which is going to cover, as I see it, the filing fees to the state of Florida, which... Um, which you know are significant because it's going to be a real school, and then um, a bulk of the rent for our first year, which will be a small place, but it'll be, a, a, um, but it'll be workable in a place that we can actually um, 
get started and running, but also document to the state of Florida um, in order to get our paperwork going. Because that's that's one um, I'm sort of saying this out of order, but that's one stipulation that is that you actually have to um, have a place, have it up and running, have it um, you know submit the fire code paperwork and all that stuff, and then then they'll give you your license to start to start um, advertising. So that's the sort of order of, of business is we want to get our place and we want to um, and then we want to file our paperwork. Um, and we've, we're already talking to some really great places down there, some great people who have some spaces. It's a great town. It's full of, um, it's full of a lot of great cooperative networks. There's a land trust there that have recently refurbished an old warehouse um, and they've got a lot of art studios and things in there and we're, we're looking at maybe going with them. Um, for a while, we were thinking we were looking at a place that was connected to the University of Florida, which is a very, very big school, and they had a little space. But I think we missed out on that space. Um, but anyway, so that's what we're doing, and that's what we're looking to achieve with that fundraiser: is sort of hit those first two targets, get some get some of that early rent paid for a small space, and and get those fees filled out. So the the sequentialartistsworkshop.org, right? Right. Or, or um, let's talk about where you are on Twitter, Comics Workshop on Twitter. It's uh, a lot shorter. You know, if you type <laughs> Sequential Artist Workshop on Twitter, you, you used up half your... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, so, yes, everybody... Saw, any variation on Saw is taken because of those horror movies. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I want to say this. I pledged, and uh, so, because I think this is important, it should happen. Uh, and I in encourage everybody who's listening to do the same. Now, I want to take, uh, just uh, before we take some listener questions from the chat, uh, I want to take down one more tack that I think is interesting, is you just highlighted a bunch of headaches in starting up a physical school. And a physical school is great because... You know, you're reaching local communities, people who actually can have that bullpen environment where they're working with other artists. You're making the friends that you're going to probably have for the rest of your life. Uh, the, these kind of fundamental experiences of, of, of learning and training, right? But yeah. are, are you going to be doing any online uh, workshops or classes kind of thing to go along with this? Yeah, we'll do some online things. And, and I'm actually eager to get those up and running. I just am a little... A little too low tech to figure out all the details, especially the collecting money and that kind of stuff. So I, I'm going to need a helper to figure that out. But we've got some plans, and I've contacted some, um, I've contacted some fellow cartoonists about online tutoring, and it, even um, even the online, I expect to be hopefully one-on-one -on -one mentoring sort of yeah. experience. Um, but it's it's sort of you know it's sort of the second or it's more like the fourth or fifth thing in my mind after some of these other major sure but, sure but I do want it to happen um, especially because I imagine um, that once I'm, I'm back down in Florida I'll have a lot more time on my hands to actually devote and I'll actually probably be a little um, bored <laughs> desperate to get connected to people on the internet you know <laughs> now I'm overstimulated but um, but no I do I, I do want to see I do want an online component but I haven't exactly mapped it all out yet Oh, it's a, it's just fun. it's funny that 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 uh, that that's a fifth step down the road. Rob and I are actually working on something right now that we've got to, uh, we're not ready to roll out a title for yet. But that's what we were working on was uh, t trying to take because like as somebody who teaches in the Southeast Michigan area, it's awesome to be able to have the one on one kind of interactions with with young people and do that kind of mentoring that you're talking about. But uh, then. I get on Twitter, uh, I'll announce a new class that I got coming up, and I get these mentions on Twitter like, oh, hey, I wish you could come to Mississippi, or I wish you could come to Oregon, I wish you could come to Southern California. Right. And that would be awesome, but, you know, it's kind of financially unfeasible to be flying me all over the country uh, unless you guys are going to charge 50 bucks a head for the class to pay for my airfare, right? Right, right. Uh, So, yeah, Rob and I started kicking around some ideas. Rob, did you want to just share a few details about what we've been working on without actually giving, you know, giving away the farm? Uh, yeah, sure. So... Yeah, we've, we've been working through, um, you know, creating a good concept for how could we uh, provide a good experience. Um, so some things that are that, that more maybe online might be better at and, uh, you know, try to take advantage of those. Uh, so let's see. Uh, you know, this is all work in progress, you know, so yeah. the, the disclaimers, you know, um, you know, consider a long list of them here. I, I won't blurt them out. <laughs> but uh it, trying to work through things like um, having a good a good community feel and how do you you know how how could you share your art and get some feedback on it? Think about your progress as an artist. Um, 
So we're trying to work in that uh, a good, fun environment, and uh, you know we're laying the foundation there. The trick I, is the trick is to not do uh, like a live class, but not as cool because it's online, right? You know? Exactly. I, we don't want it to be like a second class kind of thing. Where I mean, clearly, it's just not going to be a live class, and um, we'll just accept that. Um, but there's other things it can do as far as you know, reflecting back on prior classes or um, make, maybe making it easier to connect with uh, you know, along topics as opposed to just classes. Um, mm -hmm. Things that, that uh, maybe there isn't a workshop on, for instance, uh, comic page layout, but maybe that's sort of a, a topic that the school cares about a lot and that we all sort of converse about yeah um, but in any case we're thinking hard about what can online do that a physical class can't and mm -hmm. take advantage of that and uh, I'm, I'm sure both Rob and I would be happy to share with you what uh, Tom whatever insights and discoveries we come up with as we develop this thing we're actually looking to launch something pretty darn soon like in the next five months or so right yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that worth mentioning so something like like this pot like this podcast I mean we're recording a video stream and an audio stream that's right. that's one good example too um, you could totally add that to a physical classroom but it's just not as it's not as needed because chances are everyone was there physically, right? Mm -hmm. So we can eventually take advantage of that kind of stuff too. Yep, yep, for sure. So uh, stay tuned for that. But any, in any case, uh, yes, teaching comics is is necessary and it's awesome. And uh, you know, bless you guys for being advocates of the medium uh, through teaching as well. You know, because that's that's another way to get. The general public to uh, start to partake of this medium is, you know, people say, oh, you want to get people to read, uh, more people reading comics, make good comics. Yes, but what good does it do to do a Hutch Owen if nobody knows where, that it exists? You need advocates as well to go out there and get the public turned on about this thing as well, right? Sure, yeah. So, okay, I want to take, I want to field a few questions from the chat real quick, and then we're going to go to the events calendar, and I'm going to give you guys time to think about if you have any picks, any uh, re re recommended reads for the week for any uh, comics enthusiasts listening right now. So, Ben Ivey, who is another art teacher, asks, uh, as teachers, have you found ways to connect other subject matter to your, uh, your students may, wait a minute. As teachers, have you found ways to connect other subject matter your students may be taking to comics or art making? So, like, I guess, like, if somebody's taking, like, a social studies course or um, some other non-art related topic, have you tied in your stuff into that? Rob, I know you already have because you're talking about UI design with your work, right? Absolutely. I was sitting there working on the, uh, my pick. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll pitch it over to Tom while you do that. <clears throat> right. um, yeah, well, that, I mean, that's, that's becoming more and more... Um, Universal, I think. Uh, you walk into your average middle school, and you're going to see, you're going to see a whole bookshelf full of graphic novels, regardless of what of what um, subject you've just walked into—a social studies class or an English class or isn't that uh, awesome? Not even math and science classes these days are going to have some of those because because um, the books are finally out there, and the teachers are finally realizing that it's a way um, that kids learn is through reading this way. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the easy version of it and I've yeah I've gone in and done workshops based on um, based on social studies topics hist American history um, I've gone into a lot of English classes and uh, English classes where maybe they're reading Persepolis or um, some other graphic novel related to um, something they're studying and we've done we've created comics based on the things that they've experienced reading those co those graphic novels Lots of connections to literacy, lots of connections to general um, reading and writing abilities. Um, yeah, I mean, th those connections are much, much available now and easy to find. I imagine uh, Library Journal and any, any number of teacher magazines are writing about this stuff all the time. Yeah, there's a lot of literature being covered on the subject. Yeah, one, one example I can think of is when I, was, I did a, a project where I was teaching at 10 different Detroit public schools, and uh, I was faced with trying to teach a lesson that encourages uh, the reading comprehension skill prediction, getting kids to predict 
based on what it, what available data is there. And so I thought, well, the comics cover, at least in the magazine style comics, uh, are a terrific example of inviting prediction. So let's take, oh, let's look around the room. What are you kids reading right now in class? What is some classroom lit? Oh, Charlotte's Web. We're going to design a comics cover for Charlotte's Web where we put all of the elements that invite us to predict into a comics cover, even with the old 1960s bursts uh, in the corner, right? It's like, this is the big one, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. uh, and that was that was a really fun project. It tied yeah. into existing classroom uh, curriculum-based content, and it fostered a deeper understanding of how we predict what is happening in the story based on what the author shows and doesn't show. Oh, that's terrific. That's really great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, so yes, I, I think a lot of us have done that. Um, Casey Van Heis, I think she... Oh, I know Casey. Okay, cool. She's asking, Tom, will you be allowing for focus on creating comics digitally as well as using traditional methods? I think you talked about that earlier. Uh, she said, that's something I'd like to see comics programs start accepting more widely. Uh, part of this is a technological budgetary issue, isn't it? Uh, I know that in a lot of the schools I teach in, it's like, well, it'd be nice to have w uh, Wacom tablets, but they can't afford them. Yeah, I was about to say that I don't know how much uh, up and running hardware we're going to have right away. Um, but yeah, of course, of course. I really, I really, as as a as a reader of comics, I try to I try to let myself blur my expectations as much as possible. If it's in front of me on the screen or the page, I try and not get too concerned with how it got there, and just let myself experience the comic. As a teacher, um, I find it's very, very easy to make a lot of bad shortcuts on a computer, and so I try and short circuit that a little. Um, if somebody comes into the school I'm starting and is full of a bank of good decision making about that stuff and just wants to further their their commitment to that and make better stories then I'm all for it. But I'm so used to seeing the bad decision making that's a, um, that I that's what I'm prepped for a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's pretty awesome, though, that you are going to be pursuing that as an option. And I think that the the idea of uh, getting kids or young people to learn the crow quill because that's just the classic tool, you know, uh, that, that that's that's not necessarily a good thing to impose on every student, right? Because you you also want to teach the different learning modalities, you want to teach the different learning styles, and so on. Uh, sure, sure. So uh, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and hit the uh, calendar real quick because we got a bunch of events going on in the Ann Arbor area this month and for the month of June for the next couple of weeks as a matter of fact uh, June 11th Saturday I, and, I, and I will get a, uh, a calendar jingle to play before we do this in future episodes but we're working out the kinks on this show as we develop it uh, June 11th, Saturday, uh, I'm going to be teaching a Write With Images workshop, an adult comics class. Uh, that means a class for adults, doesn't mean anything else. Uh, at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, UMA, and that's at 525 South State Street. You can find more information at comicsgreat.com slash UMA, U-M-M-A. Uh, July 17th, Friday, Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier will be in Ann Arbor at the Ann Arbor District Library for a couple of events. They're going to be doing a live reading and some panel discussions at the in the multi-purpose multi room at the downtown library. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, for at 8, 8 o'clock, uh, Dave Roman and Kevin Coppa are going to be doing a live performance and Q&A session of Avatar the Last Puppet Bender, which is a uh, puppet... <laughs> parody show of Avatar The Last Airbender. If you haven't seen it on YouTube, it's amazing. Uh, so that's going to be a fun night, June 17th, uh, starting at 6 p.m. at the downtown branch of the Ann Arbor District Library. June 18th and 19th, you're going to get to meet Rob Stenzinger in person at Kids Read Comics, kidsreadcomics.org. That's in Chelsea, Michigan. Uh, let's see, Saturday hours are 10 to 6 p.m. Sunday hours are noon to 6 p.m. On Saturday night, there's going to be an op opening reception at the River Gallery, the Chelsea River Gallery in Chelsea, Michigan, right across the street from the library for the Comic Jam exhibit uh, featuring art by many of the participating artists at Kids Read Comics, a fine art comics art exhibition, and uh, there will be an opening reception party with music and spirited beverages and uh, some of the coolest cartoonists you're ever likely to meet. So, okay, calendar done. Let's move on to what you guys have chosen to recommend to any uh, listeners as far as what's, what's worth reading right now. Rob, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. Is, let's. I have uh, three things to mention. Is that cool? Sure. Um, so, one is, um, and what's funny is, I read a lot of comics. I either become friends of the comics I read, or I've become <coughs> friends with people, and then I read their comics. Right. So, 
there's this uh, disclaimer, but I, I think they stand on their own. Uh, first off, um, it's it's worth looking back at uh, the archives of the now um, on hiatus PCWeenies.com. Oh yeah. And uh, I mean, if you're into tech humor and and uh, anything related, I, I love it. I'm a geek, and I think it's awesome. It's uh, it's just it's a really funny comic that covers a um, um, the adventures of this uh, this family that. The um, Bob Wiener, he goes and, and works at a company kind of like Google, you know, called Foodle and all that. And there's there's some some good stuff there, uh, really funny. Uh, and then uh, there's one called uh, the Winchcomb. Uh, but sorry, PC Winnie's is by uh, Krishna Sadasivam. Krishna Sadasivam, who will be on the show in a couple weeks, so look forward to talking with him more then. Oh, but, awesome! But yeah, yeah, PCWeenies.com is a great comic. He also does UncubedTheComic.com, uh, right. which is another terrific uh, auto bio strip that he does about uh, life as an Indian American and uh, raising a daughter, and it's uh, very, very funny. So, but anyway, what was the next one on your list? Uh, the next one is the Winchcomb.com uh, by Javen Ackerman, and it's uh, sort of an English spelling of a word where it's, it's you know, the, the, like the, and then winchcomb with an E at the end, dot com. And uh, it's this, it's this funny situation of, uh, it's like a reality show playing out at a restaurant that got shut down that's getting relaunched. <laughs> and it just takes place in uh, sort of a realistic place in downtown Minneapolis. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it, uh, it lampoons a lot of local Minneapolis sorts of things. It's pretty fun. Um, if you ever if you ever worked in a restaurant, you'd probably think that's funny. Good stuff. Well, cool. Um, the third thing is, um, um, I let's see. This isn't coming up until November, but there's the Minneapolis Indie Expo, um, which is it, it's a local event for indie conventions or indie indie creators of of comics and you know various art. That uh, I mean, some pe- people are traveling across. Uh, nation for it too but it's a it's a local event i'm just i'm betting well for instance there's kids read comics that there's a lot of local events worth just checking out and tuning into that mm-hmm. you will find really cool local comics that are getting made near you that uh you know you, you may find some local teaching artists um and at the very least just fun stuff to read oh, um, cool. and these events are a good good channel into that yes these events cannot be replicated on the internet yet Right, you need local events, uh, so or both. Well, both, both ideally, yes. But un- until we can figure out how to do virtual conventions, which we may, we may figure that one out yet, uh, local events are, are a terrific way to go. So uh, the Minneapolis Indie, Ex- Indie Expo that is in November, but hey, people listen to this show long after the fact, so that's not it's not a bad idea to plug it. So uh, okay, cool. Any, anything, any else, uh, other plugs you want to throw out, Rob? That's plenty. Okay, Thank you. cool. So I'll, I'll turn to Tom. Tom, what, what's worth reading for you? Um, boy, I'm not that old, but I'm gonna sound like an old fogey. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna say that everyone um, owes it to themselves to pick up a copy of the Smithsonian Book of Newspaper Comics, um, which I think came out in the '70s or '80s. I don't know if it's been reprinted, but it's easy to find used. It's it's gargantuan. It's a, it's. I'm sure it's. 12 inches by 15 inches or something. Um, and it is full of American comics history from from 1900 onward. And, and you're going to see great, great examples of of comics all across the spectrum there. You're going to see action stuff. You're going to see great, great comedy. You're going to see Popeye and Thimble Theater. You're going to see... The Gumps. Yeah, which yeah. doesn't get enough respect. The Gumps is really terrific. Yeah, it you're is. You're see... You know, you're going to see Yellow Kid, you're going to see Crazy Cat, you're going to see Lionel Feininger's amazing work. Uh, you're going to see Windsor McKay, then you're going to see, in Skipping Ahead, you're going to see Pogo, you're going to see Dick Tracy, you're going to see Little Orphan Annie. It's just great, great stuff. And the odds are is that any any student and even most practitioners probably um, haven't even come across a lot of this stuff, or, or at least aren't familiar enough with it. And they were, they were already breaking so many boundaries early on in, in comics history. Um, especially on the Sunday page, that's kind of mind-boggling, and it's worth it's worth grabbing a copy of that. Pound for pound, Popeye or Seagar's work is just as energized as Jack Kirby's work, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. It, you you cannot read it without feeling like you're getting slugged in the face as you're reading it. Just so much is happening on the page, so much energy. And I've said this before. The, uh, was it was it drawn in quarterly or Fan and Graphics did those Popeye collections a couple years ago? Those Fan big... and Graphics still working on them. Yeah. 
Okay. And another thing that blows my mind about Seagar's work is that he worked this out to be a daily strip, but it, when you stack them up in a page format, it doesn't read like a bunch of individual strips. It reads no. like a full narrative. You can read yeah. it both ways. How yeah. the heck did he do that? <laughs> Seagar is amazing. And yes, every cartoonist, I think, should at least read his work from a uh, analytical studying standpoint, because what he does with his, uh, his movement and his moment choices is incredible. And, yeah, and Popeye's just funny. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's suspenseful. There are scenes. I think in that Smithsonian book, in that particular Smithsonian book, there's some scenes with the sea hag that are really suspenseful and weird. Um, yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, you know what? And I'll mention my my favorite book of the past few years that I think got got missed, and that is um, the Photographer. It was published by First Second. It was a it was a translation from French um, of uh, Ibert. I, God, I've forgotten Gibert's first name all of a sudden. Um, Alain? Uh, Emmanuel Gibert. And then um, he was documenting um, a photographer who went to Afghanistan in the late 80s with Doctors Without Borders. This gentleman, whose name was uh, Lefebvre, um, took tons and tons of photographs and uh, wrote in his diary a lot and had this amazing story to tell and so Gibert teamed up with him and here's the amazing thing is that it is comics, it's drawings um, and it is photographs, hundreds and hundreds of photographs all seamlessly intertwined. I never thought it was possible. Oh I honestly, wow. I honestly thought you couldn't make decent comics out of a photo. You can make fun comics out of photos yeah. whatever, but it is one of the most striking powerful comics I've ever read. Um, and not a lot of people know about it. I'm not sure why. So I'm going to recommend that. It's about years old, I think. Cool, cool. I, yeah, I have, I have not heard of that. i got to read that. Have you read uh, Gemma Bovary by any chance? By I have. I like that one a lot, too. Another thing that maybe shouldn't work because it's got so much prose in it. Yeah, but... yeah. I mean, she goes between three different narrators with three different styles. There's like a text style, a handwritten diary style, and then a comic style. And you don't notice when the transition happens. That's yeah. the crazy part of that book. I was blown away by that book. Uh, yeah. So I'm super interested in reading The Photographers. Uh, well, cool. What great picks, guys. Thank you so much. I uh, hey, have a book coming out in September. It's a new Hutch Owen collection. It's all comic strips. It's Let's Get Furious. That's what it's called. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing that one down, and that will be in the show notes as, as well. Let's Get Furious. Um, and uh, September, you say? Yeah, that's right. Oh, I should throw another plug for uh, last week. We had Dave Roman on of, of uh, yaytime.com. His book, Astronaut Academy, Astronaut Academy from First Second is out now. So go to your local bookstore, get it, or go to your local library and say, hey, how come you don't have it? Or if they do have it, put it on hold. So, okay. Thank you guys for this awesome conversation. This was a lot of fun. So, yeah, thanks. Tom Thank Hart. You. Oh, yeah. And Tom, best of luck with uh, Sequential Artist Workshop. And uh, let us know if we can be of any other assistance to you in helping this thing, this funding goal happen. Uh, and uh, any, anything else that we can do to support this thing. I want to see this thing happen. So uh, what's, what's the one best thing that anybody listening could do right now uh, beyond uh, donating? Beyond donating? Tweet about it. Tell people about it. Tell, you know, just spread the word. Let people know. Actually, the best thing you can do is find somebody who's ready to go to cartooning school and tell them about the school. <laughs> <laughs> find somebody who's itching to go to the, to the right cartooning school and tell them. We're opening in September 2012. We'll be up and running as a sort of um, doing comics and workshops and things like that in, in, in this fall. But by September 2012, we'll be an up and running. So um, and any chance we can get you to come to Ann Arbor to participate in Kids Read Comics and do a recruitment drive? Sure, I've always wanted to go to Ann Arbor. Sounds great. Oh, awesome. Okay, well, then we're going we're gonna to talk about this off mic. Uh, but, yes, okay. sequential artist workshop, sequentialartistsworkshop.org. That's right. And Comics Workshop on the Twitters, right? Right. And uh, don't forget to go to Indiegogo.com slash Creating the Sequential Artists Workshop uh, with dashes in between all of those words uh, to, to support this thing. I'm going to refresh to see if anybody's donated since I mentioned it. <laughs> uh, no, come on, everybody. <laughs> and then in the meantime, uh, Hutch Owen, uh, you should read this book. It's really, really good. It's wildly funny and uh, full of full of loving rage, I think, is, is the thanks. best way I can put it. Good term. Thanks. Uh, and, and yeah, thanks again, uh, Tom. And TomHart.net is where we can find more about you, right? Sure. So, uh, Rob, thanks for being on the show, MrArtGeekZoo.com. My pleasure, Jersey. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, thanks for, for sharing all the, the great insights. And uh, people can find uh, Art Geek Zoo. How often does it update? I'm looking right now. Uh, it, updates, it updates weekly. Okay. Um, every Friday or Saturday. 
depending on the week. And then you also have uh, babies. Is babies love comics or babies read comics? I keep forgetting. It's, uh, nope, it's babieslovecomics.com. And that's a project I do with my wife, who um, she writes the comics, and uh, I do the art. And she does uh, articles for parents and whatnot, too. Sometimes a parenting journal, but also she's been a um, um, so, uh, children's mental health instructor and whatnot before. So she'll do um, sort of topical articles sometimes as well. So, oh, sweet. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, and then, and then you're um, just Rob Stenzinger on the, on the Twitters, right? Yep, that's me. Okay, well, thanks again, guys. Thanks, everybody, for listening and downloading. And uh, you know you can help out the show by going to iTunes and leaving a nice uh, review if you thought this was interesting to listen to. Give us a star review. And then uh, more people will listen, which means that I'll have a better chance of getting awesome people like Rob and Tom on the show. So it's not just me staring at you on a camera. Uh, so until next time, everybody, uh, I've been Jersey Droz of comicsaregreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. Okay, bye. Thanks. <laughs>